Hey, what up guys? My name is HB and welcome to the final part of my breakdown video where I show you how I created my first track, Age of Aquarius. So let's go. Okay, so we finally arrived at this point where we're actually talking about the kick and how I made it. So let's not waste any time. I am making the kick from scratch and the reason why I'm not using samples is because as we discussed in previous parts of this breakdown series, it's really hard to find a really good kick sample that fits your track and it's in the right key and the right length so it's suitable for your BPM. So a lot of times what happens when you try to find a, a kick sample is you scroll on forever trying to find the perfect sample and you just can't simply find one. So then what other people do, uh, including a lot of big artists, what they do is they take stuff from different samples and try to mishmash them together. So they'll take the low end from one sample and then they'll take just the, the click from another sample and then they'll try to EQ them and compress them and distort the, the, the whole thing and try to make like one kick sample that fits their track. The problem with it is that you end up wasting a lot of time and usually the result is just decent. I think it's way better for you to just create your own kick from scratch. It doesn't take a lot of time and it's really easy to do as I can show you right here. So that's why I will never use a kick sample. No disrespect to any people or companies that are making uh, kick samples. I just don't think it's necessary or beneficial. Now I'm creating my kicks inside of kick two. I believe that I mentioned this plugin in part one. I highly recommend you get it. Once again, this is not sponsored. I'm not paid to, to say this, but I really think that this is the best plugin on the market, even though there are other alternatives that you can use. Essentially, you can use any synthesizer to create a kick sound, but I just really like the layout that it has here and the workflow is so easy and, and simple with this plugin. So what this plugin do is just generate Generates a sine wave that it's being pitched down from really high to really low really fast and the first thing that you want to set up is the length of that automation of that pitch down and usually the kick drum will complete its automation around this part right here so it's essentially one eighth note and if you remember in part two we talked about how to convert BPM into milliseconds so I went up and did that and one eighth note in 128 BPM BPM is around 235 milliseconds and if you're struggling to get like a perfect you know to, to nail that perfect parameter you can just use I believe control if you hold control and then you can move by increments of one so you get the specific number that you want. Now, after setting the length of the, the pitch automation, we're gonna go over here and set the lowest point where it's gonna pitch down to, so the lowest note. And I chose F sharp one, which is the key of the track. So that's gonna be our lowest fundamental. That's where the bass note is gonna play at F sharp one. And then you go over here and set the point where the pitch automation is gonna start from. Now, usually I just drag this all the way up, but when I was synthesizing this kick, I felt like like it had too much high frequencies so I just lower it a little bit to a sharp nine essentially you can think about it as a high cut filter so I'm just filtering a little bit of the highs so once you got all of those set up you have the length you have the low point and the high point. You're going to add two more points that essentially are going to shape the sound and the curve of which the automation is going to behave in. To simplify this, I'm going to use just one point. Now, if you don't have any points, it's going to sound like this. So as you can hear, it's just sweeping down. And when you do add a point, if you go towards this direction, you're going to make more of a softer type of kick. And if you're going to go in this direction, you're going to make more of a hard sounding kick. So it depends on where you, you put your two points, that's going to dictate the, uh, the sound and the tone of the kick. So I went and set this point first because I wanted to dictate the, the sound of the kick and make uh, more of a softer uh, sounding kick. So as you can see, I placed it at around, if you look over here, I placed it at around seven milliseconds and it's playing at the 
D sharp 2, which is a little bit more than an octave up from the F sharp 1. So basically what I'm telling Kick 2 to do is put a point right here, which is, if you remember, once again, if you're converting the BPM to milliseconds, 7 milliseconds is half of the 1 and 28th note. So half of this is 1, 2, 55. So in terms of milliseconds, I'm putting a point right here, but also in terms of pitch, I'm telling Kick 2 to pitch it from really high to D sharp 2 over here. So the main pitch down of the sound or like the larger portion of the pitch down is going to take place right here. As you can see, the rest is th there's not much of a difference between this point and this section right here, as you can clearly see. This section right here is more of a smooth pitch down, where in this section it's more drastic. As you can see, it starts from really high and goes very quickly over here. So as you can see, I'm keeping it pretty scientific and I'm choosing specific points and spots to put it on. I'm not trying to guess. Obviously, I did experiment a little bit when I was synthesizing this kick to see like where are the sweet spots. But when I figured out that, OK, around here sounds good, then I went and looked for the specific numbers where to put it. And I arrived at this location right here. Exactly. After that, I went ahead and added the other note, which it's just easing a little bit of the transition from the highs to the lows. If we take this off, you can hear how it sounds without. So as you can hear, I'm taming a little bit of those high frequencies by making them go really quick down towards the, the, the D sharp two. Now, the reason why I'm not doing it this way by curving the line is because I don't really have control over it. As you can see, it's not like it just does what it does. So that's why I'm not using the curve functionality inside of uh, kick two. It's just not that accurate. And I want to have as much control as I have over the sound. OK, so now we have successfully designed the, the, the tone and the pitch of the kick. What I'm doing here in this panel is I'm also distorting the sound a little bit. I'm using the wave distortion. I'm just putting it at 20 percent, the mix at 50 percent. And I'm not using the drive over here. So I'm just distorting it a little bit, make it sound a little bit more interesting, I guess. Now, another important thing that is uh, really important to note is that you always want to use a sine wave. You never want to use all of these options that you have right here. I never use that. I always use the, the just the regular sine wave. That's what you want. From my experience, it just never sounds good. So I never use it. I always use just the regular sine wave. Now, since we're losing a little bit of the high, because we took this point a little bit down. Also, by the way, I didn't mention you got to have this all the way up. I think in default, it, it goes like this. Th that's just the, the range of frequencies. I'm always putting it all the way up to use the entire frequency spectrum. So just keep that up. But since we are losing a little bit of highs, I went ahead and added another layer. And this is right here. As you can see, click one, two and three. Those are all samplers. And kick two comes with its own sample library that you have. I chose the hat number 24 just to add a little bit more of high frequencies to to the kick and the volume on it. I'm putting it at minus 10 dB. So I'm just adding a little bit. And as you can see, I'm pitching it all the way up and this is how it sounds by itself. So yeah, that gives it a little bit of extra touch right there. And now the other important section right here is the amp section. But in order to talk about this, I got to go and take a little bit of a detour and show you another thing that I'm doing. So if it's a little bit confusing at first, trust me, it's going to make sense by the end. So we're going to go over here to the master channel and the one plugin that we're going to focus on is FabFilter Pro MB and that is their multiband compressor plugin. Now, the reason why I'm using this plugin is because, OK, we shape the tone and the pitch of the kick. But one thing that we haven't shaped is the volume on it. And the the one question that I had before discovering this method is how do I know which frequency band of the frequency spectrum of the kick, how much volume does each frequency range needs to be at? So shaping the sound sonically in terms of frequencies, like how you would shape it with EQs, how would I know how 
much highs do I need? How much lows do I need? How much mid? And for the longest time, I didn't have any answer it for, for it. I was just trying to go by my ears. But then one day I just put Pro MB on the master channel. And this is a custom preset that I made, as you can see, the HB mastering. I'm going to put a link to download this preset for free in the description so you can use it as well. But if I'm not mistaken, it started from one of those mastering default presets that it had right there. I just tweaked it a little bit over the years. Essentially, what I'm doing here is I'm splitting the frequency spectrum into five bands. And on each band, you have a compressor. So after years of experimenting, I came up with the perfect threshold number for each band. As you can see, the highs, they have minus 28 dB, the band right next to it, minus 26, the band right next to it is minus 29, this band is minus 30 dB, and the low band is minus 21. And they're all split into specific frequency groups. So as you can see, the lows are from zero to 150. And then the next section is about 550. The next section is 1,800. And the next one is 7,200 frequency and above. So now that I have a goal to hit with each threshold, I know how to set the volume levels of each frequency band in kick two so that way i'm not guessing uh, i'm not just trying to use my ears and be like oh i think we need more uh low frequencies or maybe i need to cut this area of frequencies in the mids or add a little bit more highs i'm not doing any guesswork everything has a reason to why i'm doing so as you can see it's a very scientific method i've never seen anybody do anything even remotely close to what i'm doing here usually what you hear with people they tell you oh i just level the 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 kick at minus 6 db and that's it but when you talk about overall volume that doesn't account for the individual ranges of frequencies within the sound because for example let me show you what i'm talking about if i set this all the way to zero which means that i'm not messing around with the volume of the kick it means that all of the frequencies are hitting at the same volume this is how it sounds like and if we go right here to this panel, we can see that it's hidden minus 10.5 dB. Now, what happens if I mess around with this thing a little bit? I can do something random like this. This is how it sounds. And you can see that this sound is hitting pretty much the same. It's hitting at minus 10.7 dB. So not much has changed in terms of the overall volume, but the sound of the of the kick has changed dramatically. So that's why I never understood why people are saying such stuff in overall statements like, oh, you just need to put it at minus 6 dB. It never made sense to me because what about the overall shaping and the volume of each frequency band within the, uh, the sound? itself so hopefully this is not too confusing for you guys okay so now that we have a way to know at which volume everything needs to be in we can go back here to the amp settings and this is the shape that i came up with basically you can think about this as an eq we're just boosting or lowering certain frequencies and if we go back here you can see what i'm talking about so my goal is to hit around here with each band as you'll see right now Now, the reason why I wanted to hit around here and not hit at the zero mark, which means that it's not going to trigger the, the threshold, is because the kick is the main element of the track. Everything is built around it. So the only thing that I want to trigger the compressor on the master is the kick drum. Nothing else. I don't want any other element to trigger the compressor. So that's how you level not only the frequency spectrum of the kick, but also the overall volume of the track and the elements within the tracks, as I'll show you once we get to the mixing stage. So going back over here, maybe I didn't explain well enough why I chose those different parameters in the places that they are. You might understand like, okay, he's putting it at 30% because if he puts it more and we go back here, then it's going to hit around here and not around here. 
And the way you set it up for each individual band is by knowing the timing of each band. So remember how we set this point right here, the D sharp two, we set it at seven milliseconds, which means that from this point on, that's the low band of frequencies right here. So this is the space that this thing is taking up. It's the seven milliseconds and after, which means that within that seven millisecond window, you have the two high bands and the two mid bands right here. So if I split that in half, we'll get like 3.5 or whatever. So this one, as you can see, the 41 is, is around two milliseconds. So that's how I go about placing them within the millisecond rubric. And then I just go up and down. You can also have a visual indication right here whenever you move this you can see how it affects the wave sound and you can always zoom in and out by using this minus and plus icons and you can you know get really specific with it but yeah this is how i shape the volume uh of the sound but as you can see right here even though we set the length to 235 milliseconds not the whole kick is playing it stops right here around 147 49 milliseconds which as you can see it's a little bit over the 1 16th note it's 1 16th plus 1 64. the reason why i did that is because for this specific type of kick drums big room kick drums i want to be able to smoothly mesh it with the bass that we have because i want them to sound like one note that is hitting instead of two separate elements that are playing i want it to sound like one element that is playing so that's why i shortened the kick a little bit because if i don't shorten it and i do something like this then it means that i need to sidechain my bass to start around here instead of starting around here so this way the sidechain is going to start a little bit earlier which is going to make it sound like it's just one sound one cohesive sound the kick and the bass instead of two separate elements other than that i'm not doing anything else uh, i i don't use the eq i don't use anything else so that's pretty much it for the kick sound Okay, moving to the bass sound that we have here. We have two layers, as you can see. We have the sub and the top bass. I'm going to start with the sub, which is the most important thing. Now, any sub bass, doesn't matter which genre or, or sound or whatever you, you're using, is going to have three notes, three frequencies. It's going to have the low fundamental. In this case, it's the F sharp one. And then it's going to have the second fundamental, which is just an octave higher. It's F sharp two. And then you're going to skip seven semitones. And it's going to be the C sharp three in this case. And the relationship between the three of them is going to dictate how the sound is going to sound. If I go right here into the wave editor, you can see that the low fundamental is the loudest one since that's the most important one. So if you have more of the second one and less of the third one, it's going to sound more like a saw wave. And if you have more of the third one and less of the second one, it's going to sound more like a square wave. And for this track, usually in big room, you use bass lines that sound more like a saw wave so that's why i chose this ratio right here as you can see but whenever i'm making a new sub bass i'm always starting with the low fundamental so that's where i start from and then i build on top of that I, i'm just adding the the other layers and it doesn't have to be perfect by the way you can always use an eq later if i'm not mistaken i'm using an eq later as post processing to have the the perfect dynamic between the three frequencies so that's what i did i just added those two notes right there until it sounded kind of nice so after i sorted the volume there's one more thing that we need to sort out and that is the phase of the sound uh, i'm putting the random phase all the way down meaning that it's going to start from the same phase position every time the note is being triggered and I have here the phase of 50 degrees. Now, how I end up with this specific number is because I'm trying to align the phase of the kick sample and the bass line. As you can see, they mesh pretty well together. That's how I came up with this. So all I'm doing is just messing around, trying to figure out like which phase position is the right position until I end up with 50 degrees. As you can see right here, it looks like one continuous shot. That's what I'm trying to get at to make it sound like one element. 
movement, one sound. But there's a little cool nifty trick that I'm using over here with LFO1. I have a pitch automation. As you can see, this is in the envelope mode. And what I'm doing here is pitching down the note to go down to the F sharp one. The reason why I'm doing that is to have a smoother transition over here in this section where the kick and bass are overlapping. Because you got to keep in mind that somewhere around here, that's where we set up the, the point. This point, the D sharp two, around the seven milliseconds. So you can see that there's a pitch down. And somewhere around here, that's where the bass line is starting to go up in volume and mesh with the kick drum. So it's not that around here it plays at F sharp one. So that's why I'm pitching up the bass line by a little bit in order to help better transition between the two elements. Elements. So if you do the math, you have this rate at one eighth. So that's the entirety of the pitch down, as you remember the, the 235 milliseconds. And if we go here, you can see that I'm just pitching it by one semitone and that's pretty important i don't know why serum works that way but if you don't indicate that it's a semitone it's going to give you a different result so it's really important that whenever you want to have a specific semitone you put st after the number so yeah that's a cool little trick but try to not overdo it uh if you go up more than one then it's going to sound pretty obvious that you're doing a pitch automation on the the sub bass and it's going to sound horrible believe me it, it's not a desired effect now i do have a, another layer as we said before the drop top bass as you can see i have a different type of ratio over here that i came up with and then i'm also distorting the sound to add a little bit more of high frequencies and more information to the sound and i'm doing the same lfo1 pitch trick and that's pretty much it now in order for it to not interfere with the sub bass layer I'm just cutting everything below F sharp three. That way I can guarantee that it doesn't interfere with the sub bass. Also, as you can see right here, I'm taking all of the highs from it. I just want this specific area. I'm also lowering this frequency range around the F sharp four, and I'm taking this specific frequency, the C sharp four, which uh, uh, stood out a little bit. So I took it down by six dB. This is how it sounds with and without. And together, both of the layers are sounding like this. Now I have post-processing over here. I'm just taking a little bit of the F sharp 2 by 2 dB. And what I'm doing here is the delay effect that I showed you in previous parts where I'm just adding additional stereo information. But as you can see, I'm adding just a little bit. I'm putting it at minus 18 dB. So I'm delaying the left channel from the right channel by 7.33, whatever. That's the uh, the milliseconds, BPM to milliseconds. We, we've talked about it before. Another thing that I'm doing is I'm filtering out the fundamental of the sound because I don't want the, the low fundamental, the F sharp one to be in stereo. I want it to be in complete mono. And just to make sure that the sound is indeed in stereo, I am putting it at 100% side with the utilities you can see right here. And after all that, I am side chaining the whole bass sound, as you can see right here. This is important because if I left it right here, you can see that it creates a little bit of a peak over here. So in order to help better transition and to sell each impact of each kick, it's important to just move it over here. Now, if we go over here, to the low band, we can see that they're hitting at minus 4 dB. I'm going to put this at 4 dB and show you how it sounds, but also how it looks. And as you heard, it sounds very distorted. That's because everything else that I have after the Pro MB, I have the, the, the free clip and the Ozone. We'll talk about it in the mastering stage. So it interferes with the mastering chain, but you can also see visually right here that it takes up a lot of room. Keep in mind that you don't only have the kick and bass that are playing in the track. You also have other elements such as the leads and vocals and whatnot. So you want to make sure that you make space for the other elements. So if we put it at minus 4 dB, now the rest of the elements have 4 dB of headroom to coexist with the kick and bass. You can see all of this space is free for the other elements within the track. 
So that's why I set my sub base to minus four dB. And as you can see with this method, it's so easy to create a kick and base from scratch and to know exactly what you're doing because everything is scientific. Everything has a reason why we're doing it. We're not guessing. We're not using our ears to see what sounds good or what sounds bad. Sure, listening and using your ears is important, but sometimes your hearing just fools you and it doesn't matter how many years of experience you have. Anybody can be fooled because if you're listening to a track for more than an hour or your ears naturally are going to get tired or you're not going to pick up on all of those sudden details so that's why i think working by this method is very important and beneficial as you can see very quickly we made a good sounding kick and bass also, before we move on to the next thing, I just want to show you a visual representation of the frequency spectrum of the kick. This is just the kick. So as you can see, everything is pretty evened out right here. And then we have a spike towards the low end of the of the kick. And that's really the shape that you want to achieve. So that's how you know that you've done things right is you get this type of shape more or less. Now, after all that, I just went ahead and bounced everything into audio so I can just use one sample and duplicate it across. As you can see right here, this is the kick and bass. But I also wanted to talk about this section right here where the kick is playing without the, uh, the sub bass of the drop. I just want you to know that I'm lowering the volume on this kick by 2 dB so the kick is not playing on its full volume and the reason for that is because I don't want the kick to be hitting as hard as within the drop I want to have a distinction between the break and the drop so that way the kick when it plays in the drop it plays at a higher volume so it hits harder and there's more of an impact right there but yeah one last thing as we go right here into this section All I'm doing is filtering the highs of the kick, but also lowering it down in volume to better help transition between the end of the drop and this section right here before the outro. Okay, and that's it. Hopefully this was helpful for you guys. Let me know in the comments below. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to talk about the mix and the mastering stage. I just didn't anticipate how much there was to talk about with creating the kick and the bass. So unfortunately, I would have to create a fourth part and final part, hopefully final part to this breakdown series. And there we will talk about those subjects. But if you want to ask more questions and maybe there's something that you didn't understand or something that didn't go into further details in you can always join my live streams on twitch i stream under the username bhb i stream every sunday around 6 p.m gmt plus two time so feel free to join i'm always down to help and also as usual there's a link in the description down below where you can download the presets that we showed in this part the preset for kick 2 and pro mb so you can go ahead and download those for free other than that i guess i'll see you for part four the final part of this breakdown series next week and and yeah, I guess I'll see you then. Bye.